Good evening. Welcome to On Another Level Book Club's Author Babble, where we getting up close and personal with Arthur D.L. White, author of The Never List. Welcome, Miss White, and thank you for joining us on this evening. Thank you for having me. So, let's start off. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I uh, live here in Atlanta. Go, Georgia. Um, I've lived in Atlanta since 03. I'm not a native, but I've been here long enough to say I'm from here. Um, uh, I work for a beverage giant. Y'all know which one that is here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely love it. Um, in my free time, I get to make up stories and publish them for people to read. Uh, I'm the oldest of three. Uh, my family okay. lives way across the country in Spokane, Washington, near Idaho. So. Oh, wow. Um, I do have some extended family here, um, so I just I came down in 03 and said, hey, let's do something different. And here I am. Um, I love to read. I love to write. I like brunch. I like coffee. I like chicken. Um, <laughs> and I'm an introvert, so I really like being alone. So this whole pandemic thing is kind of a plus. <laughs> so. You know, I'm with you. I, I, I enjoyed it. I really did. I'm not mad I at am, it. Look, I am enjoying it. I'm not, I'm not mad at it. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could like go to the gym and like meet friends for brunch or whatever, but mm -hmm. I'm good. I'm real good. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have you on this evening. Love the shirt. Thank you. Very appropriate. Writer ish. My writer friend, um, Portia Dune. Dune, I think that's how you pronounce her last name. Okay. She shirts and I absolutely loved it when I saw it so I ordered one and I try to when it's time for me to write I put this shirt on because I feel uh -huh. like I wear it um and so I and then I try to wear it when I have an interview so people know I'm a writer okay and you say Portia or June can you spell that last night for us d-e-u-n d-e-u-n okay great 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 just in case anyone's interested in supporting yes so we are excited to have you here on today. Um, today we're here to discuss um, your novel, um, The Never List. Yes. So tell us, give us a little, um, a little bit about the book. Don't give away too much, but tell us what is The Never List? Very interesting name. What is it about? So The Never List is about Esme Whitaker. She is 39 years old super accomplished, went and got her master's degree. She's winning everywhere in life. She's had a glow up recently and she just has this one thing, this one big thing that she has never done. Um, among okay. other some little things like, you know, she's kind of, um, she's also an introvert and there's okay. a lot of things she's never done because she just is afraid of them or just never had the chance to like, write a roller coaster or okay. a sport or have sex, for instance. And um, so she's just kind of at a point in her life, her 40th birthday is coming up and she's like, it's kind of ridiculous. And so I'm going to just make a list, things I need to do before my 40th birthday and okay. list is have sex. And so she's got 10 things she needs to accomplish and she um, ends up in a situation where she meets a guy it is not a good situation, but okay. he ends up coming back around to him. Mm -hmm. He needs her. She needs him. They're like, hey, I'll help you if you help me. And he ends up helping her cross off the items on her. Okay. And so she's initially not interested in letting him cross off the big ones, um, but it's a romance. And so guess what happens? Okay, okay. Cross off those items. <laughs> the fun thing is that it's a work situation that they're in. And so in uh, order to avoid impropriety, they really can't sleep together, but they do deeply feel for each other. So for me, it was just trying to get around that situation and mm -hmm. make it a romance and make it sensual and make it sexy and keep the reader interested, even though up to a certain point, they really can't get intimate. So that was kind of the challenge for me and the fun part for me, but that's pretty much what the Never List is about. It's okay. About things she has to cross off before she turns 40. 
I like that. I love the, the name, the never list compared to what most pe people refer to as the bucket list. Yeah. Love it. yeah I love I it. Someone had said something to me about a bucket list one time and I was like, that's so morbid. Right. What you want to do before you die? Like, mm -hmm. that's your focus. And like so, you kick in a bucket, you know? Right. Like, <laughs> um, yeah. So I thought maybe let's just call it a never list. So 10 things I've never done. And I so, like that. Yeah. It was cool. Okay. So typically I ask these questions of authors. Um, even though I'm kind of like, uh, I feel a bit uncomfortable asking you this, but I'm going to ask you, is this book based on <laughs> your actual life? A little bit. A little uh, okay, bit. okay, okay, yeah. okay. It was okay. definitely, it's not just my story, but hmm. stories of women that I have known that waited a long time for that. And I, women I know too. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, there are women that are over 40, over 50. Mm. I was over 40 by choice. Right. Uh, I think in the book, I had a lot of fun exploring the reasons why a woman would wait that long. Mm -hmm. um, I think for some, you know, for me, I grew up religious and the message to us was good girls don't. Exactly. And I think it took me a long time to really grow out of that. But mm -hmm. by the time I grew out of it, I was like, you know what? It doesn't seem all that. Right. Awesome. You know, like I was listening to people talk about it and they just like, it just didn't seem like an experience that I wanted to jump into. Right. It meant something to me. I wanted it to mean something to him. And so for me, I just wanted to wait until it meant something to both of us. And it, it just happened to be at that time. And I wanted it to be a time for Esme. I didn't want it to be where she was afraid of men or she was afraid of sex. I wanted it to be that she waited because she wanted it to mean something. And right. she to have that experience with somebody that would make sure she got what she needed. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in that situation, I met a lot of men that did not care. Oh, no. It matter to them at all. And so, uh -uh. Just another check off. No, no. So, like, no, I'm, no. If I'm going to wait this long. Um, it needs to be fireworks. Chain. And everything. Right. It needs to be off the chain. And for him to really only be concerned about his pleasure and his experience, um, you know, I, I waited until it meant something to both of us. And so that's the experience that I wanted to bring to this book. I started writing this book years ago and I hit a wall and I put it away. And it's been mm -hmm. so long since I started this book that I do not remember why I started writing this book. Mm -hmm. uh, but I... <laughs> I do know that that was my situation and um, maybe I just wanted to represent that part of the the culture, which I think isn't as small as people think it is of women that um, didn't want to rush into that. And, you know, true. she was, she was a late bloomer uh, on purpose. And this was something that she purposely made this choice to take the step and wanted to choose the man that would take that step with her. Right. I, t I totally understand where you're coming from. And while we're on this subject, let's talk about um, reasons that women wait. Mm -hmm. um, and one in particular, is, as you stated, just as you, I grew up in a very well, let me just say this. My household was not a spiritual household, but at a young age, I was introduced to the church. So I went on that journey. OK, mm -hmm. so just because of your background, and that playing a, a role in your waiting, in which, mm -hmm. you know what? At, at one point, I was upset with the the reason why. But now I, I, I appreciate it. Right. I appreciate it. Even though I don't think it was the right reason to wait. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Did you have a problem with this voice? Or I don't want to say you're conscious because I've just been raised and it's been beaten in your head that you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. Was that a voice in the back of your head? Was that something always there um, preventing you from going further or just moving for forward in, when it comes to intimate relationships? I don't. I Definitely when I was much younger, mm -hmm. my dad's a teacher and my mother is an evangelist. So, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and we were going to hear it from the pulpit every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. Right. And so while I was um, steady in the church, yes, we were, the girls were definitely hearing that the boys, not so much. Yeah. 
Like mm-hmm. the girls are definitely hearing that. But when I was in my 20s, I went through a time where I had to define my spirituality for myself. I had to figure out what's religion and what's um, propriety. And are people telling me this because of how society might perceive me or is it for my own good? So right. it's just a lot of wrestling. Mm-hmm. I was also actually just a very late bloomer. It took me a right. long time to mature mm-hmm. and to understand really what that was. Um, I was also, um, I was overweight and I just, it took me, just took me a long time to grow up. And right. I was probably almost 30 before I really felt like I was ready for that step. Um, but when I decided that I wasn't going to wait until marriage, mm-hmm. it, I didn't have that guilt or that voice on my shoulder telling me, you know, you really need to wait. Good right. girls wait. Um, mm-hmm. Sex is for marriage because I hadn't heard that in so long. Mm-hmm. I hadn't mm-hmm. heard marriage for so long. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think maybe once you separate yourself from the people that are telling right. you that, you hear that voice less and less. Exactly. Uh, and it's, you know, it wasn't like I was just going to like just run out and have sex with everybody once I decided I, I wasn't going to wait until marriage. But mm-hmm. the longer the longer you say no, the easier it is to say no. And so for me, it just became like, I'm going to need you to work harder. If right. You, if you want this. And I just was meeting men that wanted to work that hard. And so I was like, yeah, no, it's not, it's not worth it. It's just from what I hear mm-hmm. is 37 seconds of what was that? Right. It's not worth it. It's mm-hmm. not worth it. And so it just became easier to keep saying no until I met someone that was like, oh yeah. Okay. Let's get to know each other. Let's take our time. And I was like, really? <laughs> really? Okay. And then I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so um, I really think maybe it, it's just a thing that maybe you just know deep down, you know, inside yourself when it's the right time and not right. letting people tell you that it's not the right time. You just, you have to know that you have to know that within yourself. Yeah. Well, I love the message in the book. I really do. Um, I think it's great because, you know, our young women are influenced by so much now. You know, they they have access to so much on social media, through music, and so many novels they pick up. You know, they glorify just, you know, just going with your emotions, just going with your feelings. And to pick up a novel that actually steers them in a way where you wait until you're ready to experience is awesome. So what type of response when it comes to your reviews have you received? Um, for the book. I'll tell you, I was nervous about this book. I picked it up and put it down and picked it up and put it down. And I remember being in DMs with one of my author friends and saying, ain't nobody gonna want this book because she's a virgin. And like the reviews that I read about, like books about virgins are mostly um, like uh, Regency and, um, or it's like, you know, a hot co-ed, you know, meeting the captain of the football team, whatever. It's all like, you know, young people. And people are really um, uncomfortable with the idea of a virgin in a romance novel. And so I figured that nobody would want to read this book. And I said, I'm going to write this book. If This book is going to be for me. And if nobody else likes this book, I'm going to like this book. And she's like, you go, girl. But let me tell you, people are going to read this book. And I have been so floored and so surprised by the reaction to mm-hmm. um, to the book, to Esme, to Trey. And, you know, I, I want to stress that there is not a single thing wrong with being 23 and going for yours. If right. that's who you want to be, mm-hmm. if that's what you want and you know that's right for you, there's not a thing wrong with that. And Esme is in no way chaste and innocent. Um, I think one thing she says is, it's not like I never met a man that made my body thump. Trevante Rhodes and <laughs> the earth. And she's like, I meet a lot of men that I wouldn't mind sleeping with, but she wanted to make it worth her time. And mm-hmm. so um, I, I, I think the message then is waiting until it's right. And I wanted to make sure that 
people know when you pick up this book, you're going to read about a woman that waited, but it's not going to be like a, just like a, a squeaky, I'm giving myself to a man, right. giving him this gift. And I think that that's what squicks people out about a virgin romance. So right. I was a little bit nervous about making sure that I bring that point across. It's, it's a very modern romance novel. Esme is very modern. She's very grown. She's very sexual. That was just a thing that she had never done. So, yeah. so okay. I've been very, very pleased with the response. It's gotten extremely good reviews and um, I'm incredibly grateful. Incredibly grateful. And it's interesting because one of the questions we typically ask our authors on here is what is some advice you would give to future authors? And a lot of them say, you know, tell your story. You may not feel no one is interested in your story, but there's always someone out there there's that, out exactly, there. exactly. You can't please everybody, but there are people that want to read your books. There are people that want to hear that story. And mm -hmm. Or if this book don't tell you that, uh, none of them will. Somebody, <laughs> somebody wants to read your story, so write it. Yeah. So you said you started the book, you put it down. How long, in general, how long did it take you to finish the book in its entirety? Um, so I had written about maybe eight chapters mm -hmm. in like 2017, 2018 quickly hit a wall because I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it and put it away. Once I dug it back out, I think I dug it back out this spring. So April, May ish. And then I finished okay. it. I finished it in August. So not, not, not long compared to how long it sat, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, maybe three months or so of just of like concentrated writing to finish it. And, and really if it wasn't for this pandemic, you probably wouldn't have picked it up. I finished it because I had time. <laughs> so, okay. Yes. Yes. That's good. See what came out of this pandemic, right? Right. right. I've been busy. I have been busy because I was like, you know what? I have time. I got nothing. So, time, space. Let's do it. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Is this your first book or do you have other? No, list is book 10. I have um, I have seven books that are out in like uh, ebook and paperback. Okay. Um, and then I have three that are shorts. So they're, they're really too short to be out in paperback. So mm -hmm. um, list was book 10. And my goal was always to have 10 books out in print. And so this was definitely such a celebration um, once um, that book came out. But my day. Congratulations. Was, Thank you. My debut is called Brunch at Ruby's. Okay. Um, like women's fiction, chick lit. It does have um, love stories in it, though I don't call it a romance. Okay. It has romances in it, but it's mostly, it's it's upmarket women's fiction is what they call it. I just changed the cover to this. This is the old cover. And then Dinner at Sam's, I just changed the cover to this. Okay. Follow up to Brunch at Ruby's. Um, it, it's uh, it's not, like not a true sequel, but it does have characters from Brunch at Ruby's in it. And this is like, this is a romance, romance. Okay. Um, and then I have- So real quick, I see brunch and dinner. Yes. Talk to me. So is this <sighs> Well, there's a third coming called Drinks at Minx. I just, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> um, if this I love it, okay. If this is another year, I, I have time. So mm -hmm. uh, I do have more books coming in, in the Ruby's series, I have promised them. It's just new characters are like, hey, I got something to say. And so um, new characters are really tempting to me. And so I just be writing. I just I just write what the voices tell me to write down. So. Okay. So when did you decide you wanted to become an author? Is this something you've always wanted to do? Or where did this come from? Where did it stem from? I've always been a, a writer, like mm -hmm. since I was a kid, it was something I did to pass the time. Um, like I said, I'm an introvert. I love to be in my room with my books and a notepad and a pen. Um, I got 64 notepads like right here. Um, so, but I don't think that I ever planned on being an author until I saw 
other people doing it. And I was, mm-hmm. you know, I was, I was writing, you know, stories and reading a lot. And I was, I was writing lo- novel length fan fiction. I'm going to be okay. honest with you. I was writing fan fiction and people were like, you need to write books. And I was like, nobody, nobody want to read what I'm writing. I don't, I don't, I don't, no, don't nobody want to read me. I don't, I don't even see black books out there. There's like, there's Eric Jerome Dickey and, you know, there's Terry McMillan and like Maya Angelou and, and, you know, but don't nobody want to read what I'm writing out here. And um, I think I was, I was on NetGalley, which is a site where you can read, um, you can read pre-published books um, for free if, okay. you, if you offer to write a review about it. So like okay. uh-huh. for a book and I was like, yes, that's right up my alley because I eat books alive. I just, I'm, I'm on book like 209 of the year. Like I said, oh, wow. okay. I, I read a lot. And so I was like, yes, I want books before they're published so I can brag that I have already read them. Uh-huh. And so I was on NetGalley and I happened to stumble upon Harlequin Kimani, Harlequin Kimani. And there are these books written by black authors with black characters on the cover, which I grew up in Spokane, Washington, Whitey McWhiteyville. We do not have books in our bookstores with black people on the cover. Mm. I don't know if y'all ever been to a white town. If you go to Walmart in a white town, maybe, like maybe they're like on the bottom shelf, but you don't see books with black people on the covers. And so right. I was floored and I thought, they are here publishing books with black people on the cover. <laughs> uh, I might want to get on it. And so I already had the idea, the idea for Brunch at Ruby's, which is based on a brunch group that I'm in. And we just celebrated uh, okay. a 10 year anniversary. And so I ha- already had the idea. And so I was, I started writing. It took me four years to write that book. And um, then I started trying to que- query for an agent and that didn't really work out. And then, you know, I was listening to a podcast and I heard an author talk about how she was publishing herself. And I was like, they are here publishing. They say <laughs> I need to get on it. Love it. <laughs> I self-published a bunch at Ruby's in, in 2015, and that was all she wrote. And I ain't been able to shut up since. Very good, impressive. So, throughout your journey, what have been the most difficult in trying, um, in trying to get a book written and published? What have been the most difficult part of the process? Oh man, I tell you, like most of my longer novels took me over a year to write. Mm -hmm. And most of that is because I have a lot of friends that write fast. I have an idea. (laughs) 55,000 words, boom, published. Mm -hmm. Two months later, I have another book out, boom, published. And I'm over here at like 8,000 words after three months because my process is different. I got mm-hmm. it. Like I'll get the idea and I write it down and then I might put my, together my characters mm-hmm. editing, and it just, it takes time. And so I would start a book mm-hmm. and get chapters in and hit a wall because I haven't thought about it long enough yet. It hasn't marinated long enough yet. And then I would decide, well, this book isn't going to work and I would throw it away. And then a year later, I'd be like, you know what that story means? And then I would dig it out of the trash uh-huh. <laughs> and like go back and cut uh-huh. them and piece together that and stitch to that together here and then write that book. And I think for me, it was learning how to trust my process mm-hmm. meaning that I write how I write because of who I am as a person. Right. I'm not that author that can sit down and shoot out a book every three months. That's not, that's not me. Like mm-hmm. once I have thought about it for nine months to a year, I can write a book in three months, but not today. I have the idea and tomorrow I start writing. I'm not that writer. So I think once you figure out who you are as a person, it informs how you write. If you are the type of person where if you get an idea for, I don't know, if you, I want to redo my bedroom. If you need to think about that for three months before you redo your bedroom, what makes you think you can sit down and write a book and it be all laid out for you like like all at once? Like 
when you're going to redo your bedroom, don't you have to think like from the comforter up, from the right. carpet down, the curtains, the the pictures, you kind of put it together in your mind. And I've always been the type of person where I need to think about things first and I need to piece it together in my mind and gather all my details together. And when it starts to write itself in my brain and the people won't shut up and it's starting to wake me up in the middle of the night with ideas, she could do this and he could do that. Ooh, and then after this, this could happen. And then that, and boom, there's your end. That's when it's time for me to start writing. So um, know yourself and know your process and be okay with that. If it takes you six months to write a book, it takes you six months to write a book. If it takes you a year to write a book, it takes you a year to write a book. My mother is in the chat. Hi, mama. Oh, hi, mom. Um, if that's how long it takes you to write a book, that's how long it takes you to write a book. And so you kind of have to be okay with that. Otherwise, you're just going to fight with yourself the whole time. Right. Um, and then that draws out the process. The reason it took me a year and a half or four years to write Brunch at Ruby's is because I wasn't ready to write that book when I started writing it. And I needed to think about it and put the story together and write the synopsis 112 times before I really had the whole story together. Um, and even then I quit halfway through, mm -hmm. I had to dig it out of the garbage and start over. And so, you know, the, it takes, it takes however long it takes. It's done when it's done. And so that is just how it has to go. If you can make yourself write a book in three months, that's what kind of writer you are. If it takes right. A and a half, that's what kind of writer you are. And you cannot force yourself to be different. I mean, you can, but not easily. It's something you gotta, right. you gotta work your way out of it. Right. And that's good to know yourself and know your process and trust it, you know, and that goes back to the, um, uh, what is it? A quality over quantity. You know, you can pump out books yes. every three months, but what yes. type of reviews are you getting? But if I mean, I know writers that can pump out a book every three months and they are good. And those are the writers that make me intimidated. I'm intimidated by that. And that's when I sit down and I'm like, okay, <laughs> you gotta get it together. You can do this. Sit down and write this book. But I am not that writer. And if I wrote a book that fast, it would be trash. Mm -hmm. You're trash. So um, I do know writers that can write that fast and release that fast. And those books are excellent. But I also know writers that take eight months, nine months, 11 months to write a book. And so, um, I, you, again, you have to know yourself. Mm -hmm. If you can write a book in three months and it's fire, that's the kind of writer you are. And be okay with that. And, you know, don't listen to people that are like, mm, those books got to be trash. Just writing them too fast. That's the kind of writer you are. Right. So, yeah, but it's definitely quality over quantity with me. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. done when it's done, and it's not done until I love it. And right. I don't love it until I have thought through every chapter, every nuance. I've closed every loophole. I've crossed every T. I've dotted every I. Um, when I love it, then it goes to the editor and the betas so that they love it, so they can make it perfect for public consumption. So, yeah. Okay, so looking back over your work of arts, the la all your 10 books, I'm yeah. going to ask you this. I know they are your babies. What yeah. or what's your favorite? My favorite is Brunch at Ruby's. Okay, Brunch this at Ruby's. My, yeah, this is the book of my heart. I tell people all the time, this is the book of my heart. This is the book. If you could read, if you could only read one of my books, I would want you to read Ruby's. Um, not only because it's my debut, but I feel like it's just, this is the story that I want to tell. It okay. is sisterhood. It is resilience. It is, um, it is, it is, it is, is clawing your way up from, from underneath to victory. It is, okay. It's everything that every book after it, I want to model it. I don't want to write the same story mm -hmm. over and over again, but every book after it, I want to write successful women. I want to write successful men. I want to write black men and black women mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. love each other, that can't get enough of each other. I want to write people that are doing it, doing the thing. And maybe it's not perfect every time. And 
maybe they're not very nice people um, at the outset. There's a character in here that everybody hates, and I absolutely mm -hmm. love it. Um, Maxine is a lot. She's shallow. She's she's got a sharp tongue. She's materialistic, but Maxine's probably my favorite character because it took so much to build her and. The work that I did to write this book makes it so that every book after it that I write it has to be better. It has to be as good. Understand. Well. Understand. Not saying this is a bad book because it's a really good book. So okay. Really good book. My favorite. My favorite is my is my. Favorite. Okay, I'm gonna have to. That's what I'm about to start with. So right now, I'm going to ask you to tell our viewing audience how they can get in contact with you and also where they can purchase your books. You can reach me. You can always get to me um, on my website. It's booksbydlwhite.com. I have a contact form on there. comes right to my email. Um, I'm also on Twitter at um, author underscore DL White. Instagram at author underscore DL White. On Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash booksbydlwhite. Um, and you can always send him an email. It's author DL at booksbydlwhite.com. I'm everywhere. If you Author DL White, Google me. I'm I'm everywhere. It's it's real hard to um, not be able to find me. So okay, awesome. So at this time, we're gonna peel the onion and go to another level and get to know you a little deeper. Okay, so I'm gonna okay. ask you some thought provoking questions. Okay, I want to ask is that you be honest. Okay. Okay, let's see. First question, what's a belief that you hold which many people would probably disagree with? Huh, a belief I hold that people would disagree with. Um, I'm not even sure how to answer that. Um, you can always you can always pass it. I have no idea, aside from the fact that Nutella is nasty and no one seems to know. I agree, girl. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm it sorry. It's like spoiled chocolate. It's terrible. A lot of people like it, but I'm like, why? What do you see in this? Okay. I don't have to think about that though. I don't have too many beliefs that are like out there. I think I probably agree with the general public on on most of them, but Nutella is indeed nasty. Mm. Okay, next question. Do you think crying is a sign of weakness or strength? Strength. Strength. I think that it takes a lot to let yourself be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Even if you're crying alone, um, when you get to that point where you pull all the walls down and just let everything out, um, it's super easy to hold all that stuff in, um, and it's it takes a lot of work to peel all of that back and to pull those walls down and to just let yourself feel. And I am not a feeler, <laughs> so um, I don't do vulnerability. And so mm -hmm. for me to get to that point where I can let go like that, it's I feel like it. Um, I feel like it takes a lot of strength, and especially. For you to cry in front of other people, um, for you to show that kind of um, openness and, and raw emotion in front of other people, yeah. I think that's strength. That's strength. Specifically, if you're a person that cries because you're angry, because that's like the height of emotion right there. Mm -hmm. If I cry because I'm mad, like you are seeing every emotion that I have laid out. Like it, it has ripped me to such shreds that I am actually crying. Um, and so that is, I just feel like that's a lot to to share with a person. Maybe yeah. That person is yourself. Okay. Okay. If you had the opportunity to get a message across to a large group of people, what would that message be? Hmm. I don't want to say something hokey like believe in yourself, but I feel like specifically as women, we need to advocate for ourselves. We need to always trust our gut, trust 
trust our instinct. You know you. And so specifically when you're up against someone that's trying to tell you who you're not or people that try to gaslight you into thinking you're crazy, uh, you don't know what mm-hmm. you're talking about, you don't know what you're doing, um, there's always a little voice inside you that tells you the real deal, that tells you the truth. Listen to that voice because that voice is is not likely to lead you astray. Um, so, you know, again, nothing hokey like believe in yourself, um, but believe in yourself because, okay. you know, you you know you. You are the only you out there. There's only one of you. And so, and nobody's going to love you like you do. So, um, you know, love yourself and um, follow, follow instinct, follow your gut. It's there for a reason. Awesome. Thank you for sharing with us, Ms. White. Now we're going to transition over to chopping it up with the viewers, where we're going to bring in our voice of reason, Miss Tony Duncan, and she's going to entertain questions from our view, our listening audience, our viewing audience. Awesome. Hello, hello. Do we have any questions uh, for our Arthur tonight? So far, there are none in the queue. But since we're waiting for them, to, for um, our audience to ask questions, I have a question. Okay. So in your book, The Never List, um, as you were talking about how um, the list is basically things that she wanted to accomplish that she hadn't done, um, do, you, do you think or do you feel like in the book that she may have um, gotten opposition maybe from her friends about her list, or like thought it was unrealistic or maybe even felt like, okay, like that's way too much. No, in fact, her friends and her family were basically on her about being, you know, you at this big age and, you know, you won't get on an airplane, you won't get on a boat, you, you know, <laughs> you won't do this and you won't do that. And it's affecting the quality of your life. And so, you need to get to a place where you are get you got rid of this fear and stop letting these things control you so that you can live. And so mm-hmm. um, no, her family was definitely all about her um, satisfying uh, her list, specifically mm-hmm. the big one. Um, no, they were they, basically Esme was the last one to the party on that. And <laughs> okay. she got tired of them bothering her about all the things that she was afraid to do and all the things that she's never done. And so um, that's why she wrote the list to get them off the board. Okay, awesome. So we have a question um, from our audience and it's, um, when will we get a book about Troy, Ebony, or Ken? Who is Troy, Ebony, and Ken? They are characters from other books. <laughs> <laughs> they left the lasting impression. Like, this is the only book that I'm writing about these people. This is not a series. I write standalones. I do not write series. And somehow I now have like two, three series. I'm not a series writer. And I always tell people, um, I'm not writing no more books about these people. But I have <laughs> that want stories about these people. And so they... They harass me in every venue asking for books about these characters. <laughs> so, well, they, they so, don't don't mean, so why won't? So let me ask you a question. Since you're getting so many people asking about these people, why why can't you write about Troy, Ebony, or Ken without making it a series? Uh, well, because they're from previous books. So, um, it, you know, if I write another book set in that world, then it becomes a series and then I have to continue it. But I really, those people don't talk to me. So oh, okay. I, don't, I don't have stories for them. Okay. Like, and if I think about it too hard, those people will start talking to me. So you I don't, don't want the people to start talking to you basically is what you're saying. You got to get the people what they want. <gasps> I don't want them to talk to me. So, well, I mean, get, you know, give me some time. I'll let you know if they start talking to me. But right now, nobody's nobody's talking to me. I mean, Ebony is uh, like in her twenties, and so um, I have committed to writing characters thirty and up from now on because I haven't oh, been. Oh wow! I haven't been twenty-five in twenty years. 
So um, I'm trying to write, you know, the, the grown and sexy and the romance in her prime and the seasoned characters. And so <laughs> maybe in five years when Ebony turns 30, I can give her a story. Really? We can do a time, we can do a time laugh to make Ebony already 30 and go for it. She can be 40. We'll write it. Well, it'll be like dystopian in the future. <laughs> Something like that. So. so Karen comes back and says Potter Lake is already a series. Oh, so give us Ebony at least. She's not Come on, right. Karen. Keep going. Keep going, Karen. Ebony in a future book, but I don't know if she's getting her own book. So well, well you know, I, I definitely want to continue people's stories, um, but I may not have enough for a full book. We haven't seen the last of Ebony. I'll say that. Um, we okay. have seen the last of Troy, though. We ain't seeing Troy again. I'm not writing a book on Troy. All right. I'm with Karen. Give the people what they want. Come right. on. Y'all going to beat the book out of me. <laughs> oh, my God. So that just, meant, that, just, that just lets you know that people are invested in your writing. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and your characters. And I love it. I smile every time she harasses me about a book I'm not writing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions for our author tonight? I'm surprised my mama don't have no questions. Um, let's see. Nothing's in the queue. I'm going <laughs> to give it a few minutes. Like I'm thinking, of, I'm trying to think of a name of a book for Ebony's, Ebony's charcuterie tray, Ebony's oh, did you say charcuterie tray, really? Ebony's barbecue. I mean, because everything's around dinner and drinks. I mean, right. she can have her own book. Look, <laughs> I think this should be drinks with Ebony. <laughs> Ebony, is, um, Ebony is in this series. It's a Potter Lake series. It's a um, Potter Lake is like a middle Georgia town that I made up. Okay. Um, okay. And it's like a, just like a little black town that was almost destroyed by the loss of a textile mill and a crooked okay. mayor. And um, Kate Kavanaugh, who used to play for a fake NBA team that I made up, ends up moving back there because he went to college at a nearby town. He opens up a barber shop, and he and the barber shop that he opens is putting Leslie's curl and dye. Wait, where's my camera? putting Leslie's curl and dye out of business. And Leslie's is the hometown barbershop where everybody goes to get their hair done and sit around and gossip. And so this is okay. Leslie's story. And in this story is Yvonne, who is a hairstylist. And this is Yvonne's story, The Guy Next Door, which is another Potter Lake novel. And so Ebony is Yvonne's sister. Okay. And so Ebony is like, she's just this spunky little spitfire of a girl and she was tons of fun to write i just don't i just don't have a book for ebony <laughs> so okay. you know i'm sending ebony, ebony vibes to you <laughs> i'm gonna send <laughs> ebony vibes to you so ebony will start talking to you maybe i maybe <laughs> y'all don't speak it into existence um your mom says not a question i was thinking about the homemade greeting card company right Do like you tell, i told you my whole life so when i was little i used to i used to make um greeting cards i would just you know mm -hmm. i can't draw but i would write poems and um stories and um so i guess i used to do homemade greeting That's cards cool. um yeah and um i i always tell people like my my parents were always super encouraging to me mm -hmm. when i was younger um they let me read whatever i wanted to read they would read everything i wrote um always encourage me hey, you want to write we'll buy you composition notebooks and pens and you know i was going to the library every other day and you know reading books from sun up to sundown um and that those habits and that interest were definitely that was a fire that was stoked when i was younger and then you know when i was in high school i was winning essay contests that were put on by the college mm -hmm. and my mom was helping me write those. Um, and so, you know, she, I always tell people she was, she's my first beta reader. She was my first critique partner. We sitting at the kitchen table. I'm writing about Martin Luther King and she's reading like, what should I think about this? What about this point? 
I feel like you need to expound more here. And so mm -hmm. critical thinking was, uh, you know, a big deal in our house. Um, a lot of reading, a lot of writing, and that all started at home. So if you had kids that read, that write, that draw, that code games, let them do it. Mm -hmm. Let them do it. because That's their dream. You never know. They could be, you know, 46 and, you know, writing video games or world famous artist or right. writing their 10th book, you know, you never know. They, you know, never, ever stifled my interest, you know, never stifled, you know, my literary interests or, or my growth or anything like that. And so I definitely credit where I am today to, you know, my parents to, you know, and definitely to my mom because she's right there next to me. That's awesome. Thank you, Mom. We appreciate you, you White. sharing her talent with us. <laughs> you planted the seed and look at it flourish. She sure did. Yeah. She sure did. Yeah. And in, and really to this day, in, in, you know, incredibly encouraging. And so um, so I, I always have to make sure uh, whenever I write a new book, uh, the first one has to get sent to Mama. Uh, she she <laughs> will get mad if I have not sent my books to her house. So, mm -hmm. so she you get a copy of the number list last month. So. I love it. So do we have any more? Okay, so we have another question. All right, it says from Rachel Friedman, have you completed your never list or did she complete her never list or how do you feel about the completion or the progress? Esme really did complete her list. There was one last item that she was hoping to skip because it was really, truly scary. Um, but, you know, at that point, she and Trey had um, come to a, um, a really uh, soft, intimate point in their, in their lives together. And I felt like that was one last thing that he needed to do with her to sort of take them over that, that, that proverbial, um, I, I, I don't know the word I'm thinking of, but that sort of, that leveled them up a little bit, that, mm -hmm. big, that one mm -hmm last task together and so um she did complete her list and and um when you first start reading it you don't understand how but everybody got what they needed from that book trey got what he needed in his business deal esme finished her list um the customer in question got what he wanted um everybody happy it's a romance it's a happy ending and so but working out how they get there is the magic of reading so i did not personally have a never list uh, i'm sure there's things i've never done but as i get older i get older and so mm -hmm. uh, if there's something i've never done i make a plan to do it it's good okay, awesome. awesome good question those are all the questions that we have in our queue for tonight thank you miss duncan a voice of You're reason welcome. Thank you okay, so, so I'm sorry. I said thank you so much for having me. I didn't know we were closing. Yeah, just one one last time. Share with our viewing audience how they can get in contact with you, and also um, how they can purchase, purchase your books. I am at booksbydlwhite.com. Everything that you need to know about me or, or my books are on my website. It's uh, booksbydlwhite.com/books. Um, all my books are listed. If you click on the cover, it will take you to a site where you can buy that anywhere you like. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Apple Books. Um, some of uh, select books are also in audio, if you like audio, and um, some are also in print. Okay. Everything you need on my website, um, you can reach me by email. It's authordl at booksbydlwhite.com. Or I'm on social media at author underscore DL White on Instagram and Twitter. So reach out to me. Email is probably the best because if you send me a DM on um, Twitter or Instagram, I might not see it. Um, a lot of things, you know, roll to that other box and I might not see it. But email is always best. If you go to my website, booksbydlwhite.com, there's also a contact form. You can always email me there. Those always come straight to me. And I want to say I'm very impressed with the cover of your books. Thank you. Thank you. I do my Thank own you. covers. I'm sorry? I do my own covers. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Which is very impressive. That's a good selling yeah. point. You know, um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm no, I'm no graphic designer, but you know, I do the best I can. Um, I just mess with it until. Oh no, they're uh, very nice. Uh, thank you. You wouldn't so know. Much. Very thank nice. You. Thank you. Okay, so before we close out um, with everything that's going on in society, do you have any positive or words of encouragement you would like to leave our viewing audience? Um, you know, I'm thinking about we were talking earlier about being in Georgia and how there are so many people that didn't know that their vote counted. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know that they made that would they would make an impact. They didn't know that their voice would be heard. And now we see that those voice those those votes do count. People can hear your voice and mm -hmm. you do matter. And so I want people to know that your voice matters. You matter as a person. Speak up, speak out, make yourself heard. If there's something you want to do, the time's going to pass anyway. You know, would you rather be two years from now regretting that you didn't do that or two right. years from now, you know, working the grind and working the goal and, you know, and doing what you feel like you were meant to do? Um, the world wants to read you. The world wants to see you. The world wants to hear you. They want your art. They want your music. They want your books. So, you know, why deprive them? You've got to, you, 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 you just got to put yourself out there. It's, it's tough. Um, it's a lot. Uh, being an author is a lot. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also like not reading your reviews because sometimes People like to be a little spicy in your reviews. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, kind of not putting yourself out there because you're afraid you might say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing and you might write something and people don't like it. I have two books that I unpublished because people do not like them. And really? So, yeah. Hmm. yeah. And so, um, but you have to take the risk because you matter, you're important, your voice matters, and don't right. ever 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 from this day on from november 3rd 2020 on you should know that your voice matters your vote counts love it and say it speak it be it do it be out there go do it because you know you got time it has really been a pleasure talking with you on this evening and you said you were an introvert. I don't see it, but okay, I'm gonna take you at your word. Okay. I am I'm not shy, but I am an introvert. Okay. I really like time to myself. But gotcha, I'm gotcha. Not shy, but I am an introvert. Well, we have thoroughly enjoyed talking with you on today. It has been a pleasure. It really has. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This is fun. All righty, guys. Join us this time next week. Same place, same time, where we will be chatting it up with Arthur Terrence Doctor. He's the author of Give Me a Dollar. This is On Another Level Book Club from Dallas, Texas. Stay safe and have a great night. And remember, reading gives us some place to go when we have to stay where we are. Stay safe and stay blessed.